Hey guys, I'm Shantae and you're watching my new show, Anything Goes. Today's guest is Grace Blakely, author, journalist and economic commentator. In this episode, we go way back to March 2020, deciphering all the ways capitalism has fed the outcome of the pandemic and our government's handling of the disease. But don't worry, we also talk about the role capitalism plays in veganism, romance and black feminism. Hello everyone and welcome to Anything Goes with me, Shantae Joseph. I am a host, I am a writer, I do loads and loads of things, but today it is not about me, it is all about the wonderful Grace Blakely. Okay, let's get into <laughs> it. So your book has just come out, it is Corona Crash, How the Pandemic Will Change Capitalism. How did this book come about essentially? What was it that, that drove you to write this really, really important piece of work? Yeah, so I mean, I have basically been writing a bunch of different things, kind of articles, pieces, whatever, um, ever since the pandemic began, just thinking about, you know, ever since we had the kind of stock market collapse in, mm. in March. That was the time, actually, when everyone was saying, you can't talk about what's going on mm. on TV shows, on like politics shows, because you'd be politicizing this crisis. And I remember it was one of the first articles I wrote, actually, talking about how it makes no sense to like frame this as politicizing the pandemic because right. the pandemic is already an inherently political event. I mean, if you just look at the way uh, the government responded to it, so first it does nothing, mm. thinking, oh, well, we'll just kind of, you know, let the market decide what happens, let people kind of make their own decisions. Then suddenly they're like, okay, right, we have to do something about this. We have to lock down the economy. And so who gets support? So first the Bank of England steps right. in, pulls out all the stops to save the finance sector. Then you get support for big businesses. Then you get support for smaller businesses. Then you get support for mortgage holders. Right. And then after everyone's been panicking for months, uh, you know, it took like the labor movement standing in, it took the opposition standing in to say, we need a furlough scheme, we need protection for workers. Right. And even then, once you get the protections for workers, you then don't have support for self-employed people, you don't have support for renters. So we're now facing an evictions crisis. So it was really out of kind of writing about that and knowing that this was going to change everything. But that's really interesting because I saw a lot of people talking about you know, the fact that this pandemic has proved so many of these ideas that were seen as radical, mm -hmm. like, you know, universal, universal basic income or universal basic services, were actually very doable and made a lot of sense. Do you know what I mean? Uh, completely. And I think what you just said completely hit the nail on the head because the reason that perhaps you don't see governments intervening more uh, or the, the reason the government perhaps didn't intervene earlier to kind of change things and was quite reticent and reluctant to do that is because when you start seeing the state stepping in to solve these big problems, people start saying, right, well, okay, if you can step in to save big businesses and save the banks during a crisis, mm. why can't you deal with uh, unemployment, with um, you know low wages, with the debt crisis that many families are facing, with yeah. the fact that our public services aren't working? during the rest of the time, right? Why does it take a crisis of capitalism? Mm. Why does it take a crisis that hits businesses' bottom lines to make the government step up and actually do something? And one thing I really wanted to talk about was um, what this means internationally. How does this sort of crisis not only affect our country, but other countries and our relationship to them as well? Yeah, I'm so glad you asked that because actually this is the biggest issue that we're facing at the moment. The global south at the moment, so some of the poorest countries in the world, are facing the biggest debt crisis we've ever seen. And investors are like, whoa, this is scary. These countries aren't going to be able to, to pay back these debts. So they take their money out of the global south. They put it in the dollar because mm. that's always going to be safe because of the imperial power of the US. Right. So we get this massive debt crisis where basically these countries cannot get access to the money that they need to pay for you know ICU beds to pay for ventilators to pay for PPE it's really interesting to see how these issues that come up are, are not new but they're tied to a wider more exploitative history that we don't actually really talk about especially with everything that's happening with black lives matter yeah. a lot of the conversations around like colonialism and you know britain's role in decimating most of this world yeah why is there such a reluctance to engage with with britain's really cruel past. I think the problem there is that people identify so much with the idea of Britain that when it looks as though Britain has done something bad, they think everyone's saying that I've done something bad, right? Yeah. And it creates this cognitive dissonance, which is like, if you asked these people who think the empire is good, do you think it's good uh, to like slaughter people who rise up in protest against a repressive political regime? They would say, no, yeah. absolutely not. But when it's, do you think the empire was good? They will say, yes, 
Because, I mean, and this is the thing, right? Most people are capable of holding two completely mutually contradictory facts and beliefs in their head at the same time. Mm. They want to believe that they're good. They don't want to believe that they're part of a society that's ever done anything wrong. But they also don't want those bad things to have happened. And they're broadly, you know, I don't think that most people who think the empire was a good thing actually think that the techniques of empire that were used that were brutal are good. It's just this question of like the way in which people identify with their nation mm. and how blinded that often makes you to, to things that have happened. And if you can look back and say the things that our governments have done, that is not the collective vision that we have as to what our society should look like today. You know, yeah. we all believe that we want to live in a world where our children are cared for, where we have public services that work, where, you know, our environment is protected, right? Yeah. So I think we have this kind of distorted vision of what it means to, you know, believe in and identify with a nation that mm. is all about governments, but isn't about what we as a society want for ourselves. I think yeah. that's one of the biggest problems we have today. That was just a really interesting point. You're just so smart. You, literally, your brain so is you. like, <laughs> I just want to jump in your brain and just like take it. Like, honestly, like, I'm going to call you like every week to get your hot take I'm on so down with you that. Because you, you, just, you just know your stuff and you explain it so well. We're going to play a little game. We're going to look at the relationship between capitalism and some random things. And we're cool. going to see if there is a link and we're going to have like a little chat about it. But it's going to be quite quick, but it's going to be fun. That sounds good. Is there a relationship between Capitalism and veganism. Oh, interesting. <laughs> right, so I'm going to go two ways here. Oh, yes, come on. Oh, yeah, you know, okay, so number one, I think the, the reason that a lot of people are going vegan is for environmental concerns, right? right. I think that's the reason it's getting more and more popular. Mm -hmm. And obviously, you know, climate breakdown is intimately linked to capitalism. The other thing is that as people have kind of made this lifestyle change, and again, a lot of the time, the oil companies as well were encouraging people to use words like carbon footprint. So it becomes this lifestyle choice, and then it becomes commodified and commercialized, and it makes some people very, very rich. Right. The meat industry is obviously a massive contributor to, to climate breakdown, especially kind of um, you know industrialized farming. Um, but I think the narrative that we have around veganism, which is that like, if you go vegan, if you do this one thing, then, will fix climate change. Right. It's not the case. We need to tackle the people who are at the center of this, which is the big oil companies, which is, you know, industrialized meat farmers, which is, you know, the people who are making money out of it. Exactly. So great. OK, cool. Next, 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 next. What have we got here? Is there a relationship between capitalism and cancel culture? Oh, I'm thinking of the JK Rowling's of the world. I'm thinking of what it means to be right wing and having yeah, a platform. Yeah, you and, know what? Yeah. I think it's basically a way of diverting attention from material, economic, like real structural barriers mm. and to talking about things where you can be like, well, everyone can have an opinion and we can just have this long debate about whether or not like trans people deserve to exist or should use Bam. public bathrooms, right? And yeah. cancel culture has been a really, really excellent way to stop people talking about, you know, mm wage stagnation and unemployment crises and the fact that, you know, the 1% are growing rich at the expense of everyone else. That's facts. Next, is there a link between <coughs> capitalism and sex, love and romance? Who? I mean, yeah, definitely. So to feel like you deserve love in a capitalist system you feel like you have to look a certain way, that you have mm. to behave a certain way. You know, if you're a woman, you have to be simultaneously uh, smart, brilliant, beautiful, like all these amazing things, whilst also, you know, not talking too much, not having mm. too strong opinions, like making sure that you, yeah, you look the right way or whatever. And if you don't do those things, then you don't deserve love, right? And you may not ever be actually told that, but you're constantly internalizing it from the faces that you see. That's and facts. obviously, like it's much worse for women of color. Um, and you know, it's not just women either. Like mm. the way men internalize patriarchy, we have an epidemic of male suicide in this country okay, because they don't it. think that they can talk about their feelings because yeah. it's weak, right? So yeah, I mean, it, this is this is all intimately linked to uh, to the way white supremacist patriarchal capitalism functions. That's right. <laughs> and last but not least, is there a relationship between capitalism and black feminism? Oh yeah. Oh my okay, god. Or okay. even feminism in general. Yeah. I mean, I'm obviously going to give my perspective on this as a white feminist, and yeah. therefore, you know, take some responsibility for white feminism as a thing. Do your thing. But I mean, I think. 
black feminism is much more rooted in obviously you know the struggles of women of color but also the struggles of working class women white feminism often thinks that it can disaggregate the struggle for female equality from the struggle uh, against the oppression of, of working people right i feel like black feminists are much much clearer on the fact that those two struggles are intimately linked yeah. right that the struggle against patriarchy the struggle against white supremacy the struggle against capitalism those things are all you know one great amazing <laughs> you were just like boom 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 point today <gasps> it really does go to prove though that like everything that we see as normal everything that we interact with and do daily is so intrinsically linked to like wider oh, more yeah, yeah, yeah. structures 100%. like and it's hard because like as much as you want to be like anti-capitalist as much as you want to fight against the system you can't help but be a part of it do you know what yeah I mean? and like i don't think that you know saying all these things means that you then have to go away and like try and extricate yourself yeah, from capital, yeah. like in some sort of way as if you could like go and be a hippie and live in the woods and yeah, therefore yeah. like not touch any of these systems it would make you somehow like pure yeah. and therefore better able to fight against them of course not the system is built in a way that like you cannot exit yeah there is no like non-capitalist world that we can go and live in and if there was they would shut it down. Exactly, amazing. Thank you so much for chatting to me. Now we are literally gonna go and smash capitalism. We're gonna go and do it. You've made all those connections, now we're gonna just dismantle the whole thing. Nice. We are about to smash capitalism. Keep your eyes closed. Yes, smash it! That was so satisfying. You did it. Your commentary was yeah. good. It was Thank really you. keeping me going. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.